you and I were discussing off camera about uh, your vision for twelve hundred dollar housing shelters made out of plant based plastic. What does this entail in terms of function and durability? Certainly. So, so function and durability are, are a great place to start. Based on our advanced aging testing, our uh, biocomposites, which you can see here behind us, the tall square, is about 70 years. Uh, that's the service life. Now, the other cool thing about them is um, just like your windshield with an, a, a resin injector, you can repair this stuff. So it's intended to be repaired. It's intended to be reused. Um, you know, it takes screws, uh, which means instead of like nailing or gluing it to something, you can, you can put it on and take it off later if you need to. Um, and it also packs flat. So theoretically, in, in the case of a disaster, you deploy this housing quickly onto pre-built frames. Um, you undeploy it when it's no longer needed, and you store it um, so that you can deploy it again for the next disaster, which, as we all know, uh, the climate disasters are ramping up. I mean, you know, this is timely. You just saw Maui burn, uh, mm -hmm. you know, lose most of its housing yeah. and stuff like that. Were we scaled and ready to help, we could have, you know, deployed out and gotten those people shelter in short order, right? Um, and, you know, we're in talks with several governments for that very purpose, right? So um, they can flat pack it, they can store it ahead of time, and then deploy it out when, say, a hurricane hits or a wildfire, an earthquake. Um, and this reduces excess death uh, because you're giving people a roof over their heads. People die mm -hmm. of exposure and disasters. And by housing them quickly, um, you can prevent that. Right. So um, that's that's one uh, piece of it. The, the next piece of it is talking about um, housing in uh, developing nations. Right. Um, you know, with a lack of choice, you see people using harmful materials, which obviously isn't their fault. They need shelter. Um, right. So mm -hmm. they're using things like corrugated tin, which corrodes and, you know, uh, infects groundwater with rust and other things like that. It's terrible for the environment, but it's what's available. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's an affordability crisis for materials. Um, as we all know, there's there's also the dynamic where we're shipping uh, large pieces of material uh, transoceanically, right? Like we're we're you know getting lumber from Canada and sending it across mm -hmm. the Pacific or the Atlantic to build stuff, and that's really dumb. Um, <laughs> like from a carbon perspective and a cost yeah. perspective, it makes no sense. But you know the way that um, that the world works today, um, it it seems cheaper on its face, but it's really costing us a lot. So the the solution to this is locally made materials. The problem with locally made materials is most places don't have the infrastructure to make the materials. Like, think of Bangladesh. They don't have a lot of forestry out mm -hmm. there, right? They're not cutting down their trees. They shouldn't be cutting down their trees. In fact, we should be avoiding that as much as possible. But they don't make their structures out of, out of wood, um, like, you know, places where timber is plentiful. So minus heavy, heavy manufacturing, how do these people get building materials? Uh, not efficiently is the answer mm -hmm. to that question. Mm -hmm. um, so better board is interesting in that um, it's made with simple materials and it's made with simple techniques. So the, the core technology for applied bioplastics is that we have a, a compatibilizing liquid. Um, I can't really talk too much about this because it is kind of our secret sauce, yeah. sauce, but basically what it does is it helps cellulose, which is a polymer, a hydrophilic polymer in that it absorbs water um, and helps it turn into a hydrophobic polymer in that it rejects water. That water barrier thing is what has kept all bioplastics companies from successfully mating other polymers with cellulose. Mm -hmm. So by fixing that, we've now enabled the use of cellulose in durable polymer applications. So you don't need that if you're making a biodegradable thing because it's not going to last that long. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to build a house that lasts 70 years, you must have it. It's, yeah. it's not a question, right? So with that made, um, we provide that to governments, NGOs, and private companies who want to build shelters, mm -hmm. right? Essentially, this is a, it's a hand layup method. I, I can teach you and your viewers how to make this right now. <laughs> Essentially, right. you throw down your mold, which in this case is a piece of tin. Mm -hmm. You put down a piece of mylar plastic. You put down your locally woven cloth. Now, locally woven cloth can be anything, uh, rough spun, burlap, um, anything that's really easy to weave by hand, as long as it's cellulose and as long as it's like at least somewhat tightly woven, mm -hmm. you've got your base material. So you put that in the mold, you spray it with our compatibilizing chemical, and then you paint it with thermoset resin. Now, thermoset resin, just as a quick aside, is what goes into fiberglass, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a like polyester, you know, petroleum-based uh, thermoset resin, which means it has an exothermic or hot reaction when you expose it to air. So you put that on, you do a couple more layers of that. So you've got a total of three layers. You close your mold, you wait one hour, you've got a wall. 
Mm-hmm. It's ready to be deployed in mm-hmm. an hour, right? And I, I hope you notice I didn't uh, mention any specialized equipment. No, nope. no water, no power. Uh, you know, not even specially trained people like you and your viewers now know how to make this mm-hmm. material. You know, maybe not the exact steps, but but the you know general idea mm-hmm. of how to do this stuff. So it's super low tech, and and the reason that's important is the United Nations has said that cottage industry is the most important way to bring up to help. Uh, people in developing nations, right? Mm-hmm. You could do this with a heat press. It would require a lot fewer people. Mm-hmm. Um, it would happen a bit faster, um, but you'd be cutting off access for all of these people to to you know get jobs mm-hmm. in helping improve their communities. So yeah. this is where we get into the economics of Better Board is we're intentionally doing it the low tech way in order to help as many people as possible. Yeah. So this this basically takes aid dollars that come into a disaster situation. Yeah. It gives those aid dollars to the local farmers for their agricultural products. It also goes to the local weavers who will weave that agricultural product into the rough spun cloth we need. Those aid dollars will also go to the people who are making the composite by hand. So you're essentially creating or embiggening three different industries in the host community or the local community and producing inexpensive housing. Right. Yeah. So this is around a dollar a square foot. We're seeing based on fiber prices in the area, we're seeing prices for the whole house between one and two thousand dollars. Now, that's a bit more expensive than normal shelters. You know, normal shelters are going to be polyester uh, uh, like sheet stretched over treated bamboo. (laughs) Um, And that's really cheap. Like you can build a house for about eight hundred dollars with that. So ours are more expensive. Problem is. That polyester sheet is like a millimeter thick. It tears, it breaks, yeah. it flies off when there's heavy winds. And now you don't have a shelter anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a problem. Um, so our stuff is much heavier uh, than that. Um, it, it doesn't blow off in wind. Um, in fact, at our uh, pilot uh, refugee facility in Bangladesh, ours, uh, our housing survived two cyclones back to back. Um, did not move an inch, uh, while everything else around it got flattened. Hmm. Um, so the point here is, yes, it's a little bit more expensive at the the forefront, um, but then it lasts 70 years, so you don't need yeah. to buy it again. You can also pack it up and redeploy it. So um, again, it's it's um, it's much more durable and thus much more cost effective. It gives people something to do, too. Yeah. And I think that's really important. Like um, People don't really think about the psychological aspect of being a refugee or being a disaster victim, but like you're sitting there, you're sitting on your hands, right? Like you're, you're waiting for the aid people to come. Yeah. Um, you know, you're picking through oh. the rubble. There's not much to do. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it sucks. Like the powerlessness is something that I think, um, really traumatizes people that they, they're unable to assist in their own situation. And yeah. because this is low tech and because this is done by hand, you can get these people involved in saving themselves, yeah. right? It gives dignity back to people who've had everything taken from them. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and gives them a way to actually help their communities and brings in revenue uh, for a community that's just been just slaughtered by disaster, right? I mean, you know, the, I think the estimates are Maui's going to lose like $10 billion a year in tourism, um, you know, until they, they, they rebuild, mm. right? This technology would accelerate that rebuilding. It would give these people purpose, um, you know, while they're waiting for things to get rebuilt in kind of the heavy construction way. Um, And it'll make them money in the meantime. And I think that's really important is that like, people don't like waiting for handouts. Making your own money is is the best. I mean, we're Americans for Christ's sake. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So so getting them involved in saving themselves, I think is is both a psychological and an economic and a kind of a practical solution.